we're in a, a, a tremendous need to address the trust deficit that the world faces. And these kind of conversations are essential for that. Um, the current paradigm in which the major states are pursuing their self-interest has reached a point where uh, the foundation of all international relations is at risk. It is the principle of Pacta San Servanda that promises must be kept, or if previous promises that are entered into with the uh, sobriety of legal power are ignored, then dialogue to go forward into the future is undermined. And that's the most serious challenge we face. It's called the trust deficit. And the trust deficit, I think, is even more severe than the trillions of dollars deficit between the needs to fulfill the uh, Agenda 2030, the SDG agenda, and presently it's over two trillion a year as a deficit from what's needed to be funded. Uh, because without the rebuilding of trust, there's no capacity for dialogue. So I want to just highlight one of the areas where you can see this breakdown in its severity and then suggest how we have to focus on moving forward and what the task is before us and how human security fits into that and how common security, which is the expression of human security among states, fits into that. I believe that the third most important legal instrument of the 20th century is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty following from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which follows from the most important legal instrument of the 20th century, the United Nations Charter. And the NPT has been relatively successful. It has constrained the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and it's been instrumental in helping take us down from over 65,000 of these horrific devices to less than 14,000 today. But if a mere 2% of those weapons were to be exploded, the amount of soot into the stratosphere would render civilization a, uh, a dream of the past. And the suffering uh, that would uh, ensue, even from a small exchange of these weapons, is beyond description. So the way in which the world has dealt with this challenge has been through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty negotiations, in which diplomats in good faith since its indefinite extension in 1995 have laid out over 60 commitments that would make the world safer promote and strengthen the rule of law and and walk us toward the legal commitment embodied in the treaty and explicitly affirmed in the unanimous decision of the international court of justice to obtain a nuclear weapons free world those commitments included the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, a fissile material cutoff treaty, lowering the operational status of the weapons and their political salience, strengthening the verification systems and safeguards. The problem is that the diplomats have negotiated in good faith all the nations, Russia, China, the United States, France, the United Kingdom, the P5. But when they go back to their capitals, despite the fact that they've argued to the international community that they can be trusted, that they're pursuing strategic stability. When they go back to their capitals, the countervailing arguments, not of strategic stability, not of moving toward disarmament, not of finding cooperation and addressing this existential threat. The countervailing argument based on a fifth century Roman adage, pursue peace, receive war, Pursue, pursue war, receive peace, peace through military domination and strength prevails. And thus, as, as we speak today, the militarization of economies of the major states has gone to a burlesque proportion, gone to the proportion where literally trillions of dollars are being squandered in making the weapons, not just nuclear weapons, but the new high-tech new high-tech digitalized hyper weapons are being dramatically improved. Improved means to an unimproved end. It is simply the wrong bus. 
Since 2000, over $25 trillion has been spent in this pursuit of security through military domination. This has led to the privileging within the nuclear weapon states of the bureaucracies that see the world as a perpetual realm of conflict, as a perpetual world of the jungle of the strong alone survive and the cooperative are marginalized. And this is very serious. As Joe Biden once said, don't tell me your values, show me your budget. And we can see the shortfall of the funding of the sustainable development goals, which is implicitly a human security agenda of addressing the realism of the real threats that humanity faces and the absolute gorging at the financial uh, trough of uh, military expenditures. So that to me is what's before us. And the problem is that it's based on mythical thinking. It's based on denying the realism that says that we have to cooperatively protect our third lung, the phytoplankton, which is 60 to 70% of our oxygen, which depends on the pH of the oceans, which depends on the climate stability. This is not an option. The, uh, the fact that pandemics do not recognize borders requires not a vaccine apartheid world, but a cooperative health approach. The fact that we're cutting down the other part of our third lung that we all depend on, the rainforest, faster than they're replenishing, not to mention species destruction at a thousand times the evolutionary base rate. So those of us who are saying we need to get on a different bus, a bus that's not dependent on perpetual fear, threat, and uh, military thinking and exercises, but make the case time and time again that this is mythical thinking. Now, it's very severe when you have major states saying that they will define basic human rights based on their sovereign ad identification and that they're not universal. But the vast majority of countries have recently been expanding the definition of human rights with realism. Last year, the General Assembly adopted the position that a sustainable environment is a human right. A few years before that, that the threat and use of nuclear weapons is a violation of human rights. So I think that we need to make the argument that the fundamental universal human rights of the planet Earth today require cooperative security approaches amongst the nations of the world. That, this, that anything that opposes this is essentially mythical thinking that must be challenged by all those who respect science, who respect reason, who res and those who respect values take the human rights approach. It's a, we have to have a large tent approach to the pursuit of saving the human species and the planet Earth. So there are some, like Governor Jerry Brown, doesn't want to call it uh, human security. He wants to call it planetary realism. Well, that's fine with me. It gets to the same place. Other people want to use the human rights paradigm and expand the definition of human rights so that it's comprehensive. That's fine. Others want to say, we have the sustainable development goals. This is a commitment of the world. We have to achieve them. That's fine. It doesn't really matter, but we have to challenge the actual reality of, as we speak, the ongoing threat of nuclear weapons, the ongoing increasing reliance on, on, on war and militarization. Now, that's not to say that we can just roll over and allow the illegal war in, um, uh, in the Ukraine. But let me point out that when the president of the United States said that we were going to invade Iraq and the people of Baghdad would come out in celebration, my wife said, nah, I don't think so. And when Vladimir Putin said that Russia was going to invade Ukraine and the people of Kiev would celebrate their liberation from the so-called Jewish Nazi, I said, no, nah, I don't think so. Now, here we have the heads of two, of two countries 
leaders with the, with the heads of them, the singular ability to actually end civilization, not utilizing the cognitive of common sense that any cab driver in either Baghdad or Kiev could have had. This is an unsustainable situation. So it's our job, it's our job to challenge the current paradigm that relies on military threat as the key means of pursuing security with what is realistic. Science is on our side, human values are on our side. What has not been invoked is the passion of the power of ethics and the power of love. We seem to be reluctant to say to the public, this is an issue of do you love your children? Do you love the children of other nations? Do you understand that the world, because of science and technology, has become so small that a mistake in one room in one country could end civilization, and that mistake could be made by any country? And that the technology that we have today could easily provide the elimination of the extraordinary disparities of wealth and a thriving relationship to the natural world. But it is our thinking that has to change. And the human security approach is an absolutely mark on approach because we know human beings are sacred and part of the entire web of life. We can't survive without the rainforest. We can't survive without the diversity of species. So I say very simply, love people, use things. Never love things and use people. That's an ethical norm that will be helpful because when we put our concepts and use our concepts to divide us, then we undermine the very core of our peace and security, which is our birthright, our legal right, and our human right. So these discussions on how do we change need to be more uh, like this one that we have today with brilliant people speaking need to be expanded and become uh, be realized how absolutely important it is that we change the direction from fear to the hope of human security.